Hello, welcome to the show, Sophie and Hannah. Thank you Hi. very much. Hi. Thanks for having us. Okay. For our listeners, we are joined today by Sophie Stockbridge and Hannah Melian, who both are currently working at the Royal Berkshire Hospital in the UK. Sophie is an occupational therapist and Hannah is a physiotherapist, and they both work in collaboration with Dr. Deepak Ravindran to develop a series of assessments and treatments for their long COVID clinic. Today, we walk through the meaning of long COVID, its implications, and how to best assess, manage, and treat it. I am your host, Aditi Bhatt, and we are joined today by our dynamic co-producer, Ken, although you can't see or hear him. Ladies, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm going to sort of jump right into it. Um, Mm -hmm. But for starters, uh, can you explain how you define long COVID? um, And at what point do you look at long COVID being the cause of symptoms when a patient comes in? Yeah. (laughs) Sophie and I are both looking at each other going, who should answer it? But I I I can go first, it's It's fine, I don't mind. Yeah, it's so true (laughs) and it's virtual. But yeah, if you you begin and then I can always fill in after, I don't know. That's fine. There are, yeah. So uh, in answer to the question, how do we define long COVID and, you know, when do we start thinking about long COVID being that possible diagnosis? I mean, um, uh, the World Health Organization has a really good definition of long COVID. And here in the UK, we also have um, nice guidelines that give us a really good definition of what long COVID is for us as well. Um, and we'll we'll use that definition to kind of help us with, with um, our colleagues that want to refer into our service. So it's defined as a continuation or a development of new symptoms um, following a suspected or a confirmed COVID illness. And those symptoms need to have continued for 12 weeks after that initial um, illness. The important thing with that as well is that it needs uh, those symptoms um, need to kind of be like other conditions ruled out from those symptoms. So there needs to be some sort of workup and investigation, you know, ruling out other conditions, other diseases that could cause these symptoms. And when those have been ruled out, then that's when we're saying, actually, it's it's probably long COVID. I think the difficulty at present is that we don't have a specific diagnostic test for long COVID. There's not a specific, um, you know, simple test that we can do here um, in the UK on the NHS that says, right, this person has long COVID. Um, so we really do have to work to, to that definition of collection of symptoms 12 weeks or longer and not explained by any other condition. So it's really a process of elimination. Exactly. It really is. Yeah. Exactly. And we were saying um, how other conditions can really be so similar to long COVID as well, like especially ladies going throughout the menopause um, later in life, you know, you can get very similar symptoms to long COVID. So again, as Hannah was saying, we just need to really tease everything apart and say, is it another condition or is it actually long COVID? Yeah, and I remember you bringing this up in our first conversation, Sophie, because I was quite shocked on hearing that. Um, if you like, if you hadn't told me, I would have never known that um, somebody presenting with menopause symptoms could possibly have long COVID if you know so, some things don't match up. But it brings me to my next question, which is: What are the are there any common symptoms that are usually that usually come up in cases like this? Yeah, so I suppose in terms of COVID, like long COVID symptoms, um, the most common ones tend to be fatigue, breathlessness, um, problems with concentration and uh, muscle aches and pains. They tend to be the more common ones that we would see in a person with long COVID. But actually, there's over 200 recorded long COVID symptoms. So it's really wide ranging. And that kind of can be a little bit difficult then, I suppose, when we're thinking about, is this long COVID or is this something else? You know, it's kind of like, you know, they, it, it, it can be difficult. And, and like Sophie said, if you've got symptoms that are very similar to another condition, is it one? Is it the other? Is it both of them at the same time? You know, is there a bit of an, uh, of an overlap, which there can be? Um, so it's not always as clear cut 
as, as as it might seem, you know, on paper. Um, but those are the the kind of major symptoms that we'll see a lot of people coming through the clinic with. So what does the structure of this initial assessment look like for patients with long COVID? And can you explain the significance of each component of that? Okay, yeah. So what we do, so their GP will first of all refer them to our service because they got suspected long COVID. Then we'll send out a questionnaire before they come to our clinic. And that's when they tick, you know, what symptoms they're experiencing, how they're affecting them, things like that. So we can get a bit of a better picture of what's going on. Um, Then they come in for their first meeting, first appointment with us. And it could be with a doctor and myself, so occupational therapist or physio and a doctor, or it can be physio alone. You know, whoever we felt would meet their needs best from an assessment. Then we talk through with the patient, look at their past medical history. Um, again, like we were saying, you know, try and tease all the symptoms apart. Could it be long COVID? Could it be something else? At that stage, if it could be something else, we will send them for further assessment, further tests, just to make sure it is that instead of long COVID. If we say, no, we're confident it's long COVID, that's what's causing your symptoms, then we start the rehab process so depending on what symptoms they have if they've got a whole cluster of them we've got a virtual online long COVID group which Hannah runs and it's six weeks long and they go through all the different symptoms so fatigue breathlessness pain you know lots lots of different symptoms so they can get lots of information and also the peer support as well is really really helpful so that's one avenue Another is just more one-to-one face-to-face meetings because maybe the the person doesn't like the idea of the group. So that could be with a physio, occupational therapy, um, whatever kind of suits them best, or psychology, we offer offer psychology as well. Um, I sort of offer this brain fog clinic where we focus more on the brain fog or for their work, so like reasonable adjustments for their work, if that's a you know a big a big worry for them, and that's impacted them a lot day to day. And we've also got the app, so it's a virtual platform, and we meet them once every sort of six to eight weeks virtually, a bit like Zoom. So we zoom in and we check in on the patient with patient, and then also they can complete. Um, like a fatigue tracker on the app and they can track all their symptoms using the app as well. And do providers have access to um, the other side, basically the data from these patients then on the app? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So So I find this so interesting because then you have a variety of interventions available for patients to come in and sort of pick and choose or they can go through the whole um, whole thing, right? And especially the peer-to-peer support, I find that so fascinating. That's really interesting. So what role does the C19 years play in this assessment? That was a significant yeah. part of your abstract. It's so the, um, the COVID-19 Yorkshire Rehab Scale um, is a an assessment. Oh, I got tool. that. I got that whole thing wrong. Then. <laughs> no, no, no. You didn't get it wrong. I've ju- I'm just giving it the full title. Everyone then kind of shortens it down to C19 YRS. So it's absolutely fine. You, I just gave it the full title. <laughs> um, so uh, and you know they've uh, they've got a really helpful web page on Google if anyone wanted to kind of have a look at it in more in more depth. Um, but it was adopted here um, in the UK quite quickly as a bit of an assessment tool as a, a, and a, a measure, I suppose, in terms of the different symptoms that a person with long COVID is experiencing and the severity. So there's um, there's um, a naught to ten scale for kind of like every question um, as part of that assessment tool, so that you can really gauge, you know, um, how 
how severe that one symptom is, then move on to the next symptom, how how severe that is. In our service, we, we use it as part of the questionnaire that we give out to the patients when they're referred to us. So what we'll do is we'll, we'll send that out. As soon as we receive the referral, we send that out to the patients for them to, to fill in. And when we receive it back, we'll use it as part of our triage process, as Sophie was saying, so that we can try and figure out, okay, what symptom seems to be the most important to this patient and therefore what clinician should we put them with or what combination of clinicians should we put them with so that we're, you know, delivering the right person at the right time um, for that for that patient. We'll send it out to them again after they've been through our, our intervention or, or our rehab pathway. So we send that out to them again, they can fill, fill it in again. Um, and we do have um, a member of our team then kind of looking at looking at their scores and, and looking at the differences between right at the beginning of their, their journey and kind of the, the end of their journey with us as a clinic. Okay. And so what can you explain then what, what each discipline within this sort of multidisciplinary team you've got going on um, assesses in long COVID management and rehabilitation? Uh, how do their approaches differ and how do they collaborate with each other to provide comprehensive care? I yeah. feel like, uh, <laughs> Sophie, you can probably talk about OT seeing as you are the OT. Absolutely, yeah. So from an OT point of view, so obviously OT, occupational therapy, what that means, so occupation, that just means anything that uses up time in your day. So any sort of activity you can imagine from brushing your teeth to going to work to looking after your family, whatever fills your day, we're interested in. Um, and how long COVID is it impacting your ability to do the things that you want to do? So that's what I'm interested in, just to see if, you know, they're very, very fatigued and they're coming to me and they're saying, look, I can't cook myself a meal. I'm just so fatigued. Um, I can't do it. So I haven't been feeding myself. It's like, OK, let's focus on that activity and see how can we make it easier? How can we adapt it? Um, or is it is it something in you we need to adapt? And then that's where we very much cross over with the medics or physiotherapy to see actually is there a physical need going on? Is that why they can't do it? So obviously medics, doctors will look at medication, blood tests and see what else is going on for the person. Um, and Hannah will explain with a physio, you know, more, so, you know, breathing, uh, more internal systems going on. Um, and that's sort of very much where the joint work really well. Definitely. And uh, yeah, I think that there are so many kind of like crossovers yeah. between kind of physiotherapy and occupational therapy in all disciplines. Like wherever I've, I've worked, there's always a really nice collaboration and a really nice crossover between physios and OTs to be able to kind of deliver that that care for that patient. I think in the long COVID clinic, like Sophie was saying, you know, the terms in terms of like fatigue and energy management, you know, yeah. physios have a little bit of a role there as, as well as OTs. Um, I think maybe patients might be coming from a bit more of an exercise perspective as well, because yeah. let's not forget the, the average long COVID patient is quite young. And before they had long COVID, they were very fit and active and, you know, had a really full kind of life. And they're looking to get back to that. And so I think, uh, you know, Sophie and I can kind of collaborate on that to, to you know, whether it's uh, helping someone kind of figure out how they return to going back to their gym classes or, yeah. you know, like Sophie was saying, work and family life. Um, I think with physio as well, we will also be helping them kind of manage their pain and manage their breathlessness um, and kind of looking for things like breathing pattern disorders and, and retraining their breathing so that, you know, they can actually feel like they've got a quality amount of, of breath going in, which will then in turn mm -hmm. help them with the activities that, that Sophie exactly. was talking about there. Because exactly. you know, we know that fatigue can impact but if we're out of breath when we're trying to cook a meal, you know, that's just as difficult as, as the kind of energy kind of consumption in that as well. So we, we, we might have 
slightly different approaches to to some of these tasks but i think there's there's a lot of kind of common ground and a lot of um joint up working so whether that's kind of we're working with the same patient or whether it's just we have you know clinical conversations about a patient together that we we might have you know concerns about or it might be kind of like oh i've done the breathing work with them now i'd really like them to to have some input on cognitive rehab or or fatigue rehab and you can kind of transfer that care over and that works with like with psychology and with the medical um uh, doctors in the team as well you know i think pathways throughout services feel quite linear all the time as in like you're kind of stuck on one pathway and you continue through but luckily for us in our long covid service because we are collaborative and we have that approach you know if if we feel a patient needs physio first and then maybe goes to psychology afterwards we have that capability within our team definitely and i think it has to be flexible yeah definitely um, so how do you measure um, sort of outcome or do you use assessment tools that can be used to evaluate long COVID symptoms like fatigue and cognitive issues? So this is actually a really kind of huge topic, I'd say, um, in the U- well, definitely in the UK um, at the moment in terms of what outcome measures are the long COVID clinics using because there's not really any kind of consensus on which ones to use. Every service probably uses a variety of ones that they feel comfortable using. Um, There's lots out there. And uh, as Sophie mentioned before, on the um, app that we put some of our patients on, they can record outcome measures on there. And there's quite a number of them on there. So there's things like the facet fatigue scale, um, the dyspnea 12. um, There's things like the PHQ on there and the GAD on there as well. So there's there's actually quite a few on there. It can seem a little bit overwhelming, I suppose, to fill them all in. so yeah, we can we can use that to to help kind of track a, a patient's kind of progress and, and symptoms, and it's really um, it's really nice to kind of see it on the graph because we know that long COVID is a relapse and remitting condition and that people have flare ups and things. So you can go on there, you can see what their score is, and if it seems like things are going a little bit downhill, you can reach out to that patient and say, "I've noticed your fatigue scores have gotten a little worse since last month. Like, let's have a conversation. Let's let's talk about what we can do or what we can do to to support you." So there's there's a, numerous outcome measures out there, and um, and even within kind of our, our local area kind of like clinics in in other counties are using slightly different ones to us but um i think in general that that most of the um symptoms are are covered and um in whichever kind of outcome measure you you choose to use okay um that brings us to an end of the questions that i had planned but i do want to ask a few more (laughs) Okay. Um, so when let's talk about the conference, right? I want to talk about the long COVID workshop that you've planned out. Uh, yes. What can attendees expect out of it? Trying Sophie, I think you, you can take this one. i what we wrote for it out. <laughs> so what they can expect <laughs> is just a really good overview of how we assess long COVID, what are we looking for, what other con- conditions are we trying to rule out? Um, and then in terms of therapy, what we offer our patients. So in terms of physiotherapy, psychology, uh, medical intervention, occupational therapy, what can we actually do for these patients? Just to help them manage their symptoms. Because of course, with long COVID, the main ones are like fatigue, shortness of breath. Um, and we're not, you know, we're not a cure. There isn't a cure as such, but we can help them manage and cope a lot better with their symptoms. And then we we were also looking at I'm trying to remember. Was it um out? Yeah, Hannah, do you want to add anything? I think what we. <laughs> I think what we'd plan to do as well is is not only think about that assessment point of view, which is obviously key to really figuring out what what support can we provide within the limitations that we've got right now. You know, research is going on worldwide and we're ever hopeful that someone will 
be able to discover something that can give patients more than just management strategies. But at this point in time, that's where we're at. And so I think we'll be bringing kind of um, more depth about what is pacing? How do we pace? How do we advise a, a patient on, on how to pace? How, what, what does that look like? You know, what's the success stories? What's the things to be kind of aware of? I think returning to work is key. You know, we've mentioned this earlier. We've got a really young population of people that have long COVID. A lot of them, their working life has been disrupted. So what, what do we do as a clinic? What are our interventions? What do we recommend when it's, you know, having a safe return to work and and that that looks probably quite different to normal return to works um and kind of why we do it differently and and hopefully that it ends up being successful and more importantly sustainable so that that person can go back to you know work is one but you know we've got lots of parents that come through clinic that you know want to be able to kind of run around in the park with their children again and and their long covid's kind of stopping them from doing that at the moment so hopefully we can go into a little bit more more depth and bring some case studies as well you know we've we've been open for about two and a half years now we've um we've had over two thousand people referred to us so We've hopefully got a little bit of experience under our belts, but that that means that we've just got a wealth of of knowledge from our patients. They're the experts, um, and they're who we learn from. So that's what we're going to be bringing forward with us. And can I just say that from everything that I read on the internet, and I have a problem with being chronically online. Everything that I read about long COVID just puts me in a very sad state because, of course, it's the patient's experiences. And uh, for most of us, we've come out of the pandemic, right, so to speak. Um, COVID doesn't exist. We're double vaccinated. We've got a booster shots. We're out. We're back to work. But for those who are suffering from long COVID, that's not the case at all. So there is such a... Um, dissonance between what they're experiencing and what sort of everybody else is experiencing. So talking to the two of you uh, gives me another view into what is happening on the other side, right? And that brings me so much hope. And I hope our listeners feel the same way because um, there is a way that we can manage it. And while the case can look very different from person to person, uh, using different interventions, using a multidisciplinary team, um, I think we can get a lot done. So thank you, ladies, for all the work that you're doing. And I'm really excited to see what you all come up with next. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much.